Maybe we can, uh, we can start, uh, Tanya, with your last lecture. Thank you very much for uh, joining us. Yes, um, thank you. So... Oh, wait, there is a... Do you, it, it's okay? Yeah, I think it's okay. I yes, can we can screen. see we can see the slides. Okay. All right. So today is the last lecture, and uh, I, um, you know, I think I saved the best uh, for last. So we will have, uh, um, hopefully, an an enjoyable um, lecture. I prepared lots of. Uh, figures and um, kind of a summary and um, so please uh, remember to ask questions as much as possible so uh, to summarize the last few lectures we discussed that for binary responses there is information preserving population vector and uh, if it is a logistic function of a linear argument then there is this simple readout it's always linear in uh, neural responses, but it can also be <clears throat> um, linear in terms of the argument of the logistic function. Then we said that because of this nonlinearity, because of this logistic nonlinearity, um, when added across many neurons, you have a compression, and the infinite um, space of inputs is compressed into finite range that depends on the number of neurons. And this compression can, one of the ways of thinking about this is um, uh, a hyperbolic representation. And so the, in the neural code, you have two to the n values, but they are, because of the logistic function is a continuous function, you get a topography in the space of the representations. And so, <clears throat> yes, I will upload, uh, I guess there is a chat about lectures four and five, I think, so um, I will upload these lectures um, later today after this one. So optimal hierarchical code, um, and then we have a representation of hyperbolic space. So the plan for today is I will show you, so that's optimal, so, or predicted to be optimal. So, and then the number of neurons um, is uh, correlated with the curvature or the size of um, the hyperbolic map when measured in units of um, curvature. So, um, it's a little bit counterintuitive because sometimes we talk about the radius of the space and sometimes we talk about curvature, but they are actually um, the same the, the same quantity. Either you have a space of unit radius, but curvature is large, or um, curvature is one, but the, the space is large. And then if the curvature is less than one, that it means that the space is not very hyperbolic. So the plan for today is, um, is um, Um, that I will show you evidence of hyperbolic geometry in various um, instantiations of biology. So one of them is um, produced by plant volatiles. So you can think of it as metabolic signals and a communication between plants and animals. Then we talk about hyperbolic geometry in human perception. Uh, we, we don't have, we are working on it, but we do not have concrete figures for hyperbolic geometry in, uh, from neural data. And uh, the third part will be hyperbolic geometry in mammalian gene expression, so within the cell. So that's the plan for today. So uh, often people, um, you know, one of the questions is, uh, so, we think that um, this nonlinearity, the logistic function that I described, it's uh, in neural circuits, but it also, as you know, in uh, within a cell. 
many of the uh, activation factors for intracellular molecules, transcription factors, and so forth. They also have this logistic um, nonlinearity. And many of the signals are organized hierarchically. So for any hierarchical network, hyperbolic geometry provides a good approximation, a continuous approximation to it. So that's another um, justification or motivation for why we are looking for hyperbolic geometry in or using it in various places. So in the first part, I will talk about um, distances between molecules. You can think of also this of, as distances between neurons, but um, there are many papers for distances between um, neurons, um, for example, correlation. And the thought was to use similar distances between molecules. So in the case of molecules, it is a long-standing problem, and one approach, which sometimes we also follow, is to define distances according to physical chemical properties of the molecule. So each molecule is described by a number of descriptors. It can be uh, how long is the carbon chain, what is the molecular weight, does it have a ring, um, and so on, you can have 1,000 descriptors. And uh, the question often arises how to find uh, parsimonious description of uh, all of these measurements. And um, one possibility, um, so you, you can apply these uh, tools that I'm discussing today with these um, descriptors. But uh, in this talk, we use the statistical dis um, definition of distances. So what do we mean by statistical definition? So you think that any natural source, such as strawberry, produces many molecules at the same time. And uh, you can have uh, many different samples, just like uh, we talked about in um, neuroscience. You have many different stimuli and we can compute correlation between neural responses across different stimuli, we can now think of each molecule as a neuron and how they and compute correlation between their abundances as a function of different samples. So in this particular data set, uh, the data is from uh, food industry. So they are interested in making the tastiest strawberry. As, uh, maybe, maybe in Italy the, the fruit is better, but uh, here the, the fruit is kind of uh, uh, a little bit wooden. No, so, no. Okay, muted. I'm muted or I'm, I'm mute, unmuted? Yeah, I'm muted. Okay. Okay, and uh, um, um, and so what what we have is um, um, the measurements of uh, various abundances of molecules. So in the commercial strawberry, you, there are various evolutionary arguments that you can make, but you might notice that it doesn't smell as nice as. Um, a wild strawberry that is not in the field. Um, some say that's because uh, the strawberry that is on the field is going to be picked up and going to be eaten, and it doesn't need to invest any extra energy into smelling nice. But to overcome this um, problem, so the, this study uh, measured um, different genetic varieties of uh, strawberries and abundances of molecules. So from this table, you can take um, the measurements of abundances and compute a correlation. There are other, with understanding that stronger correlation means that they're part of the same pathway, or if they're not part of the same pathway, they might be um, 
um, of from two different pathways that have the same transcription factor that activates them. So in other words, stronger correlation means that there are somehow more couples and have smaller distance. You can have other distances. We can uh, talk about information distance between, uh, between molecules. And um, we, we can also look at Euclidean distance between many of these um, abundances. And we can discuss one of the questions that can be raised is, if we are looking for hyperbolic geometry, but we have measurements along thousands of components, uh, is it okay to use a Euclidean distance between these uh, components? So that's a point for discussion, and I will show you some evidence that it is okay, and why why that might be. So in our case, um, so stronger correlation means smaller distances. Any questions? Because usually, um, uh, usually this is uh, the slide where the definition of distances is not clear. Any questions? So, uh, Carlos. Hi. Uh, could you? Uh, sorry, I didn't understood between which variables the correlation is being calculated? Yes, so the correlation is computed between these two variables. So this is a, um, a trace for one molecule as a function of samples, you think in the natural world, and um, another molecule. So then you take correlation between these two values. So in other words, you know, in principle, you know, what is it in, um, as we discussed, like natural stimuli in vision, I take a camera and I walk around um, and then I make a movie and then I compute correlation between two pixels and then we plot a power spectrum. So if we think about natural, uh, natural stimuli in auditory processing, we take a microphone, we go across various environments, there are data sets like that, and uh, I can compute uh, distances between, um, say, different frequencies or um, in different moments in time. Now, what, what's the analog for the olfactory world? So one possibility is to also walk around and record whatever smells you experience. And uh, this method, what I'm, these data sets is an approximation to this. Rather than walking um, randomly, maybe uh, they say, well, let's look at this fraction of natural world. So in this case, the strawberry. And now you know, we can compile other data sets that represent a compilation across many different food sources. So wines, cheese, beer, um, meat, um, um, you know, we will talk about mouse urine. So all kinds of uh, um, environmentally salient signals for, you know, for mice and, um, and, and then compute correlation between, between molecules. Is that okay? okay. So um, the distance is computed between, between molecules. So, Tanya, you can also, yes. I have a question. So, uh, so if you take a strawberry, and then uh, it will it will have uh, uh, lots of uh, chemicals in it. I mean, also it will have all proteins uh, and uh, uh, all types of uh, meta met metabolites uh, because it's made of cells. And uh, so, are you taking uh, the uh, strawberry itself or are you taking the odor and how are you uh, defining the the odor i mean the the um, i mean I, I guess it should be what is released by the strawberry right in in the air yes yeah, so in practice what what it means is that um, 
There is a sample of strawberry. In this case, you know, they, they mush it up in a food processor and then they put a sample into a gas chromatography and uh, measure the abundance. Okay. So these are all volatiles. In, uh, there are also studies, and unfortunately the data set was very small, but um, so in this particular case actually, for these strawberries, they can also measure the sugar content and the acidity uh, content. But with other food, um, uh, I had a small data set where they measure concentration of um, um, like omega-3s and um, various um, other nutrients. And uh, this is, I would say, even more interesting because um, in the case of the volatiles, so we are now, um, it is a true communication system because uh, the strawberry is producing volatiles. Uh, part of the, those volatiles are to attract the animal to eat it. And so the animal has to figure out, they're not that interested in the volatiles, but they're interested in volatiles as an early uh, detector of what's inside. So, <laughs> You know, sometimes food stays in the refrigerator for longer and, you know, I smell a sandwich and say, hmm, should I eat it or not eat it? So that's an early detection. And, you know, through experience that, or at least I know, if it smells a certain way, then maybe I shouldn't eat that sandwich. So we learn that, you know, metabolites, the, some of these smells are not from strawberry. They can also be from a fungus or bacteria that... Um, ferments the strawberry. So another, mm -hmm. in the ongoing work, we are also studying um, green strawberries, ripe strawberries, and rotten, overri uh, overripe fermenting strawberries. And you can um, tell a difference by whether the fruit is um, fermenting naturally or um, fermenting in a predefined way where it has been pasteurized, sterilized, and a specific um, uh, yeast was added. Mm -hmm. So some of these smells are from um, other, <laughs> other species. Okay. Okay. Yeah? So, um, um, so thank you for the questions. Any other, um, any other uh, question. So, because um, usually, um, yes. Yeah, so, the distance is between molecules, and you have many molecules. And now we want to create a map of these. Um, you know, I would like to have coordinates um, for molecules, just like we have coordinates for space. So, mm -hmm. in um, for space, we have say x, y and maybe some abstract quantity, which we don't know. And in olfaction, we start with abstract quantities. So, um, and uh, so that's an example of creating a map for reasonably abstract quantities. Mm -hmm. So now, um, this is an analogy. So I hear, I'm not sure maybe, People can correct me. I heard that earlier, at some point, in, in I gave a talk in Paris, and he said that um, um, the title was "How to Make a Suit with One Measurement," and all kinds of tailors came. And he opened his presentation by saying, "I'm going to approximate human body as a sphere," and then they all got up and left. So. I don't know whether that's true or not, but that's what I heard. And of course, he was working on projections on how to put a curved surface on a flat, um, flat map. So in our case, imagine that you're given distances between cities on Earth. And based on these distances, you should be able to figure out that um, what is the geometry. So if the distances are within 
Europe, then we can say it's consistent with the flat Earth hypothesis, but otherwise um, it's not going to fit. So we are trying to do a nonlinear dimensionality reduction in two steps. First, um, figure out what are the rough properties of, um, of the space. What is the curvature, positive, negative? What is the dimension? And then once we know the properties of the space, then we can put points on it specifically to respect the measurements that were, that were taken. And I will discuss today several methods. So some of them are uh, well established, such as multidimensional scaling, which we are adopting for the hyperbolic geometry case. And the other ones are more topological, and they all have um, their advantages and disadvantages. So in our case, we have a measurement between molecules. So this is a sample segment from a matrix of six molecules, but think of it as, in reality, it's about 80 molecules. And in the case of genes, it can be uh, thousands of genes. And um, the other one is the, um, to create this matrix with, uh, by putting randomly points on various surfaces and seeing whether the statistics of distances that you get matches the statistics of distances um, from the measurement. So in this first study, we use the topological method. But as I mentioned, there are other, other methods um, that we will discuss with respect to other data sets. So in this particular case, we use the topological method. Um, it's, it's related to persistent homology, but this particular algorithm is from Vladimir Itzkov um, publication with uh, Gusti as the first author. And uh, the advantage of this algorithm, why we liked it, is that you can compare the two matrices just by subtracting them. And this can be problematic if there are nonlinearities in the individual measurement of distances. So this is a non-metric method because um, it thresholds this matrix and uh, at a given level, and it, it assigns connections if the distance is less than uh, the threshold value. And then for a given threshold, you convert this distance matrix into a network. And then this network is evaluated according to how many holes of different kinds are there. So by cycle or a, a hole, they, uh, we can look here we have uh, these nodes 5, 3, 1, 6, and they're not fully connected. So 1 and 5 is not connected, and 3 and 6 is not connected. So this um, part here will be a cycle. And once um, 3 and 6 are added to the network when we lower the threshold for what constitutes connectivity, then uh, this cycle will disappear. Um, so, um, this is an example of uh, the so-called Betty curve, but they plot the number of cycles <clears throat> as a function of the edge, edge density, meaning what is the threshold. So, low density means very high threshold for what's <laughs> very strong correlation for what constitutes a connection. And then as you lower your criterion, you, the number of cycles will increase because the network gets more and more connected. And then it will decrease because it's going to fill then. So the general shape of the curve is that it rises and then it goes down. And you can have cycles of different uh, dimension. So this can be um, cycle on the order of um, two, 
but you can also have like a hollow pyramid, so which will be a cycle of the order of three. <coughs> um, and then using this method, um, it's a rather sensitive method to the distribution of distances. So if there is any um, kind of uh, hubs in the network, uh, then the the network will be will grow and fill in and different um, in different ways. So the shape of this curve will be different. Uh, and um, any questions about this part? Ah, oh, there is a question. Uh... Can you repeat what, what are those matrix and uh, how they are computed? Okay, so the matrix on the left is um, computed from the data. So it doesn't have to be strawberry data. It can be any kind of data set that, that you have. I think in principle, you know, it can be economic data. Um, so it's it just your, your variables. Uh, in this particular case, we are talking about molecules. So it's the distance, uh, the, uh, the correlation between uh, molecule one and molecule two across various samples. So that's experimental matrix. The matrix on the left is, I'm trying to find an embedding for my experimental point. So I'm, uh, in this particular method, we are trying different geometries uh, of different dimension, different curvature. So for example, let's think about um, a sphere. I will put the same number of uh, points as I have in the data on the left, randomly on a sphere. I evaluate distances between points, and I get a matrix. And then we will compare these matrices whether we can detect um, statistical differences between the two matrices. So and Tanya, then we will take yeah. yes. So is uh, the dist so the distant the matrix on the on the left, is it obtained from a correlation like this? I don't know if you can see the blackboard. I can't uh, see, but it is this, uh, correlations like um, xi times y. Uh, yes, um, a correlation may be normalized by the variance, but um, yeah, okay. Other than that, other than that is okay. Yes. So yes. So th this one, this value, and then. Cij divided by square root of uh, Cii squared and Jj squared. So um, now yeah. you you, you, so, you have yeah. So with this distance, you, as you know, as you might notice, you have you can have a few problems with this distance. For example, it can be negative. <laughs> it can uh, also not quite um, respect oh. the tri uh, triangle inequality. So these are various issues that we ran into. Um. Something like this, no? Yes, I think so. Something, yeah, you can, um, yeah, so the distance can be this. Now, advantage of this, um, um, uh, I think we even took um, e to the um, minus, so correlation. So advantage of the topological method is that because it's based on the rank ordering, you can transform the distances through a monotonic function and you will have the same result. So you can have this distance dij or you can have e to the or you can have e to the dij so uh, exponentiated. Uh -huh. So sometimes that helps with negative values. Okay. Um, 
So D I J e to the minus C I J. Yeah. So for example, that that would work. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know you can also have, and so according to the topological method, the, it will you will have the same result. Mm -hmm. Whether you define distances this way or even it can be e to the minus uh, c i j squared. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so now, okay. so, um, so you can have any function here. So any function, and what you are saying, uh, if this function is decreasing, uh, then uh, and uh, then. Uh, the ranking of the distances will be the same, essentially. It yes. will be the same, uh, the inverse ranking of the correlations. Yeah, so that's, that's one of the advantages of this topological method, that because we don't really know how to define distances. Distances are defined in a somewhat abstract way. Mm -hmm. So if we use a topological method, then we are invariant to this. We can find the geometry. And then with later methods that I will describe, once you find the geometry independent of the metric, then oh, of a precise definition of distances, you can see maybe if I move around with um, um, play around with the definition of distances, I will find the one that works the best uh, for uh, a specific metric embedding. That, 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 okay. that's, the, that's the one of the possible logic, um, but I'm open for other suggestions. So that's so far, the, the thoughts so far. Okay. okay. Uh, Any other question? Yeah, uh, I'm still a bit lost on how you construct the geometric model. I mean, if, if I understood right, uh, the the second matrix is obtained from uh, points randomly sampled in the in the geometric model in the geometric space. But how you construct this this space from from the data? So it's. Um a little um, for for this approach, it's a little bit of a discrete fitting to the data. So you say, well, uh, the curvature. So for the curvature, if we are looking for a space of constant curvature, then there are only three options. It can be positive, negative, or zero. So we say, well, suppose we look at Euclidean spaces, which is what it's called did. And uh, we will look, put points randomly in Euclidean spaces and see whether we can match them to the data. So maybe I will give you another. This is also from his figure. So the, the central figure is for Betty curves for a matrix where the distance values are selected at random. The one on the left is the distance matrix where they call it the geometric model. They consider it Euclidean spaces of different dimen dimensions. So the dimension is shown here. And then you fill the cube with a um, uh, random number of points. And what they showed in their paper is that um, the behavior of these matrices, uh, these Betty curves, is very different. So you can then map what you have um, and compare it with the data, which one fits better. So it's kind of uh, a discrete fitting. You have a discrete number of possibilities within Euclidean space of different dimensions, and we are trying to see which um, of the curves fits the data better. So for example, after a while, um, the Yuan Sheng, who is a student in my group, who was working with this, you know, he developed an intuition for this, and he could look at experimental Betty curve and say, you know, this is, uh, 
you know, hyperbolic, not hyperbolic, this radius, not that radius. So for the random matrix, you see that the magnitude of these um, Betty curves uh, with order grows. And for geometric model, it decreases. So that's one of the signatures. And then you can see the amplitude of the first peak depends on dimension. And in this particular paper, in Gusti's paper, they applied it to hippocampus. And incidentally, um, they said that it is, doesn't fit the random um, matrix, but it fits the geometric model. And um, they uh, said that the geometry that it fits is very high dimensional. So it was um, about 80 dimensions. So now my interpretation, which I haven't looked at their data, but my hypothesis is that the data is actually hyperbolic, but I need lots of dim Euclidean dimensions to describe hyperbolic data. So this is a little bit of a tangential comment, uh, more of a discussion. Is that, um, does that answer uh, the question? Uh, yeah, almost, <laughs> let's say. Almost. So let me then show you another graph, and then let's see whether um, maybe it, it will help, and if not, we will circle back to the parts. So now, in our paper, that we were interested in hyperbolic spaces, so we said, well, the same thing as Gusti, but now points are put on a hyperbolic space, also initially randomly, and then we will um, move them around when we can't quite fit them. So, um, and you can see the behavior of, uh, say, hyperbolic curves red relative to Euclidean. So they are, for example, much closer in um, the peaks of these curves are closer than uh, what is shown for the Euclidean space. And I think this is in three dimensions. So in this particular method, the optimization over space is not done in a continuous manner. You, you have a, just a table in, um, of uh, curvatures and the table of dimension and uh, you discreetly by hand um, change parameters of the space, which is curvature and dimension, and you put different number of points in it, evaluate the matrix, from the matrix generate the Betty curve, and repeat this process many times, and then you have a distribution of Betty curves, and then we are trying to match the kind of expected range of Betty curves to the one that is observed in the data. Now, now back to, back to the uh, audience of what, um, which aspect we should discuss more, what wasn't clear. Uh, for me, I think it's uh, the construction of, uh, of the curves. With which you, the construction of the cubes here? The curves with which uh, then you compare, the, the distributions with which then you compare with the... Oh, the, with the construction of the curves, right? Yeah. So, so let's talk about construction of the curves. So you have a matrix. Let's threshold it. And so we rank order it. So we have the sum of the distance will be the smallest and some of the distance will be the largest. So the rank order. And then you cut it at the level of, first the threshold is set to the smallest distance. So then only two nodes will be connected and everything else is disconnected. Because two nodes are connected, everything else disconnected, there are no cycles because the network is not connected. Then you say, well, let's lower the threshold. And at some point, um, two nodes become connected. And it can be in a sequence, 
or it can be two disjoint nodes that are connected. And then you lower and lower, and then um, then there is some, you know, percolation can happen. So you, you can have uh, closed paths. So that's the first cycle. And then this is what's plotted here on the y-axis, the cycle for a given threshold density. And then as you lower the threshold, so this would be an example of a cycle because it's not a fully connected. So if I add three to six connection, then um, kind of five, three and six collapses into, um, you know, um, can be contracted to a point and, uh, and so it's no longer a cycle. But in this case, it is a cycle because I cannot contract it to a point. Okay, so you consider only uh, cycles uh, uh, as uh, the loops uh, that, are, that have no, say, diagonals, essentially. Yes, so then the topologists, they, they talk about uh, different kinds of uh, um, loops or holes in various dimensions. So this will be... Um, dimension um, one. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then you can have, think of a pyramid mm -hmm. where the, the top and the bottom are not connected. So then it is a cycle of order two. There might not be cycles, individual kind of uh, lower dimension cycles are all filled in, but there is a kind of a two-dimensional hole inside. And then you fill that in, and that hole will also disappear. And then you can have higher dimensional cycles. So they, you, know, they, you can compute many, many orders. So you don't have to compute all of the orders. All, you know, for, for if we truly match geometry, and we match it in terms of the first and the second Betty curve, we can make predictions for the third. And if it matches, if the geometry is truly matched, then we are okay and it will match the rest of the orders. Um, in practice, what happens is that these higher order cycles, they, are, um, they, they take exponentially longer to compute uh, on a computer. So the CPU time grows exponentially with these cycles. And at the same time, their real, the variability in them also increases. So they become progressively less and less useful for comparing between data and um, uh, various geometries. Uh, we need, uh, ah, okay. Yeah. So, uh, I have a question. Uh, why in different dimension, the edge den uh, density will change? So, I think that if uh, the, in different dimensions, the the density, you know, like in higher dimensions, points tend to concentrate, for example, in Euclidean spaces, right? At uh, the distances uh, will be uh, close to the, um, to constant. So there will not, there won't be as much diversity in terms of um, uh, distances. So in different dimension, when I put points in different dimensions, the distance matrix um, changes. And it also changes in the um, hyperbolic case. Uh, for example, let's see. Um, so a picture of the hyperbolic space. So there are more po in a hyperbolic space, most of the points are near the edge 
and the distance between them goes through the center. So most of the distances are 2R. And uh, there is a narrow distribution of distances outside of that value. And I think for the Euclidean, maybe that's a derivation that can be done as part of, um, um, if you take many random variables and uh, compute the distance between them, I think the distance uh, settles to one over n. Is that, um, do I remember that correctly? Matteo, do, do you remember? <laughs> Uh, um, if well, you take lots if you... of var random variables, and um, in you know Euclidean spaces, then I think the distance between points, um, the, the variance is one over n. Um, yes, yeah, so the distance the... maybe decreases. Um, I think in one dimension it should scale as one over n. Then uh, in two dimension. Uh, I don't know, maybe also 1 over n. Oh. Well, let's, yeah, that might be a nice, uh, um, I will, um, maybe that, that's a problem we can consider for the exam. You can start thinking about it. Uh, I, will, I, will, I will do the derivation before the exam, and then we will um, try to, um, figure out uh, how, if you take the random variables and uh, you compute the, uh, the distance between them, the expected distance between them, xi and xj, for two random variables, I think it goes as one over n. Uh, and one, of, one over g, <laughs> if uh, um, the variance along each uh, dimension proportional to sigma and uh, um, because the distance is normalized so well if there is a break I will try to yeah. um, think of uh, um, think of the exact uh, scaling is that okay, okay. I, I hope uh, yeah, of that. So basically, um, when you add more variables, the distance, uh, the expected distance between them changes as a function of dimension. <laughs> more, more questions? Okay. So, um, and then you can evaluate distances between these curves according to a number of measurements. So the easiest one is the integral of the curve. And in this case, it just number of cycles like integral, it called integrated beta value. But you can also try to match the exact shape and that would be a more sensitive measure. So in this particular case, so we, we are back to our strawberry data. And as I mentioned, for spaces of constant curvature, which it doesn't have to be constant, but this is the first approximation, you can talk about um, curvature being positive, spherical spaces, very dimension, Euclidean, and also hyperbolic. And this is interesting because hyperbolic would imply the kind of maximally informative coding with on-off devices and also congruent with the hierarchical network. And then when you do the data evaluation, you, you find that you can rule out uniform distribution in Euclidean space, uniform distribution on the spherical space, and the semi-uniform distribution in the hyperbolic space matches. So it turns out that the, dis the distribution of points was not quite uniform, but was concentrated on the poles. We think it's, there is some cyclical variation due to the circadian rhythm that um, um, best matches the data. 
So I think that's the uh, summary of this data set. And if you want to see the Betty curves, then uh, the Betty curves, I think, in the data is the, are these dashed lines. And they, there is a variability around these dashed lines. But you can see how well one can fit them either with hyperbolic space in these curves or with Euclidean space. So with Euclidean space, the, the, the peak position is different from the data, and they decrease much faster. So then that's the paper where the data comes from. <clears throat> so if you're curious, the code is publicly available. The data set is publicly available. So you can uh, run, run the analysis. Um, and then, as I mentioned, there are many other data sets. Um, this is, was a strawberry data set, a mouse urine data set, blueberry data set, tomato data set. So in, in each, there are about 80 different samples and variable number of molecules, about 80 for the strawberry. And uh, blueberry, I think, was the least of about 40 molecules. And uh, what I'm showing here on the top graph is comparison between the data, which is in triangles, and um, the best fitting hyperbolic geometry <clears throat> of a given radius, and the best fitting Euclidean geometry. And you can see that, for example, here, it doesn't match in the third order. Uh, mouse urine doesn't match in the third order. Here it almost matches in the Euclidean case. Um, we'll discuss why, and also in the tomato. So the differences are statistically significant, but when you do not have a lot of points, then you can account, um, it becomes more difficult to pick up hyperbolic effects compared to Euclidean case. So questions about this graph and also whether there are previous questions that need to be followed up on, followed up on. Uh, so I think uh, what you are describing is uh, topological data analysis applied to these uh, data sets. I uh, just put on Slack uh, uh, introduction, some introduction slides uh, on topological data analysis that also shows, uh, explains uh, how you derive Betty curves uh, in a, say, more detailed uh, uh, fashion. Okay. I think uh, what you have here is essentially you compare uh, this Betty, uh, say, uh, these Betty curves, I mean, the integral of these Betty mm -hmm. curves uh, for uh, yes. the data, the, the network that you get by threshold in the data, uh, the correlation matrix of the data, and the ones that you obtain from randomly drawn points uh, in a uh, uh, d-dimensional uh, uh, space uh, with a certain curvature, right? So we have a, yeah. another question. Can you maybe show us the the formula of the of the curves, uh, the beta, beta curves? The formula? Yeah. I mean, they're all numerically computed, so there is no formula. Oh, okay. But what what are the parameters beta in? Uh, the different oh, so data. the parameters, uh, um, you mean one, two, and three? That's the order of the Betty curve. Or the parameter of the space. Yeah, no, I meant uh, beta one, beta two, and beta three. Yeah, so beta one would be, um, would be a cycle like this, number of cycles of this kind. So 1, 2, and 3 is not a cycle. 3, 2, 4 is not a cycle. 4, 3, 5 is not a cycle. But um, 5, 3, 1, 6 is a cycle. And 5, 4, 2, 
six is also a cycle. So there is a code that goes around and counts the number of cycles in a, in a given network. And you can have also cycles that are um, kind of have a two dimensional. So you think of this as a ring, as a one dimensional ring. Um, like a circle. So it's um, kind of topologically equivalent to a circle. But you can have a cycle that is topologically equivalent to a sphere. And, and also in higher dimensions. So that would be beta 3. Is that okay? Like you have a cloud of points in the dimensions. And then uh, you look at uh, holes. And you, you have holes of uh, dimension one. You have holes which are spheres, or say, uh, equivalent to spheres up to deformations, or equivalent to hyperspheres, et cetera, et cetera. This is uh, more clear. So wh when you have these points in D dimension, and you connect points uh, which are closer than a certain distance, then uh, you have, uh, a, say, a geometrical object, OK? And this geometrical object uh, has uh, a certain topology. And topology is uh, determined by, like, uh, holes, OK? And uh, holes of different dimensions. Yeah, I, th I think that the problem is that I never took a course or something in topology, so I don't have any idea on that things. Yeah, so I think, uh, yes, this is uh, a subject that probably should be a course of its own on topological data analysis. And, uh, but, um, yeah, so you can uh, look it up, but uh, yes. So, so Gravin, there is another question here. Yes, uh, if we define it that way, at some point uh, we have like a close data set because uh, this each data point will uh, be connected to another data point and so on and so on. So uh, I'm trying to imagine the, the, the example you just gave. So we have, uh, we can say that there's like a, 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 a graph that closes itself, it's some kind of topology and, or how it's defined in the way. My, my question is, to be more punctual is, uh, how does the graphs are topological different from one another regarding the whole concept? Um, Tanya, did you understand the question? Um, maybe a rephrase. And so, yes. um, um, so the way I understood, mm -hmm. we have a given network. And you yes. can start contracting these uh, cycles. And at some point, you, you can't. So okay. and then you see how many n n these non-contractible cycles are okay. there. And that's a characterization okay. of a network. So, so and then you lower the threshold. And you see, well, how many cycles um, are there now? And some of them can be removed. And so the number of cycles First increases, then decreases. Okay, so we can draw a correspondence from cycle number of cycles to number of holes, or it's not. Uh... Yeah, no cycle number of holes is num You know, the, the, in in my maybe, you know, at at my level of analysis, they are the same. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cycles are holes. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks. So now this is um, fun with data sets. Strawberry, um, and now so now we have it. You know what we found that it was a three-dimensional uh, space that fit all of them, and um, 
it was approximately the same level of uh, radius or curvature from which um, my interpretation of this is that um, well, we can talk about it. So my interpretation is that they, these are the data sets of similar complexity. Now, and this will become maybe clear in a moment. So we start with, um, say, a three-dimensional tree, like, like this. And as I mentioned that one way to visualize hyperbolic space is to compress this three-dimensional space into a sphere. So just like we talked about Poincaré circle, where the infinite plane is compressed through this tension on linearity into a circle of radius one, which is unattainable, and you have different curvatures. Or you can have a certain radius, and the curvature is set to one. Same thing here. Um, in a three-dimensional space, we, we are visualizing the space as a sphere. So I told you that the space is not spherical, but we are visualizing it with a sphere, and I'll show you the, which you can think of as an envelope of a tree. And uh, this is now visualization of once we know this dimension, we can put the actual points onto that space. So each point here is a molecule. So now we have our map of molecules in this space. And to show you that this is not, these are just two example molecules. This is uh, some kind of a, a common in, I think it was this kind of Scandinavian berries. Um, anyway, so now the distance between them, as you know, the distance between molecules, you have to go inside the tree and then out. So this is an example drawing of a geodesic. And we can see it in now in 3D. Hopefully. Oh, sorry. So now we can uh, talk a little bit about this space. So as I mentioned, these are all volatile molecules. And we find that they're all positioned on the size, um, kind of on, close to the edge of the space. Now, if so what this method gives you is that you're observing leaves of a tree, but by estimating the curvature and dimension, you can estimate on average the branching process that is inside the tree and is unobservable to us. So if we could uh, measure the um, non-volatile um, content of a strawberry, which there are data sets, or I hope there will be in the future, um, of um, various sugars or acids or other nutrients, then those molecules will be uh, positioned inside the sphere. And the reason we get this embedding is because our data is limited to volatile molecules that are not themselves, um, they're all kind of like children. They do not cause other molecules because they are, in a way, end products of the reactions being volatile. Any questions? No. It's okay. Uh, so now, uh, or, or there is a question. Is there a question? Uh, yeah. No, no question. No questions. So now we can uh, analyze this problem as a communication. As I said, that olfaction is an interesting way of uh, communication between plants that are that cannot move and animals that can. So there are all kinds of stories about how when a plant, when it's sensing that they're being eaten by a herbivore, then they emit a pheromone that attracts the birds that will eat the thing that is eating them. 
So uh, here is an example of the communication. So for, for now, these are the math that is derived exclusively based on statistics of uh, strawberry data. And now we add human perception. And this is a combined data set between strawberries and tomatoes based on the overlapping set of orders. So there are more points. And the color shows how much people like strawberry or um, tomato. So the red axis is the one that points towards the most preferred um, kind of uh, strawberry. And even and one can see a topography that uh, for human rankings that emerges, um, you know, is not should didn't have to be present in the data, but you know, I think because uh, there is some logic to our perception, and that's the reason for, for this mapping. Okay, so what these three axes are, the red one is the, the most uh, highly ranked, uh, um, the perfect strawberry there. And then there are many axes you can define. You can think about acidity of the sample, you can think about the boiling point, of the uh, molecule. And because the space is low dimensional, you can now um, make predictions for um, one, um, how pleasant something will be or smell based on, for example, acidity of the sample and boiling point of uh, the molecule. Okay. So here you have so, uh, data of uh, yeah. both uh, strawberries and uh, tomatoes, and the pleasantness yeah. uh, is the same. Is the same vector for both? Well, we computed we computed one vector, but you can um, because it's a joint map. But um, in um, in the graph on the left. You can kind of you can do a cross validation, meaning the axis is computed using one subset of orders, and then you predict pleasantness for a novel set of orders that were not used in computing the pleasantness axis. So of course the the pleasantness axis will fluctuate depending on which molecules you include in the data set. So in, in reality, there is an error bar. Uh, based mm -hmm. on this um, uh, axis. And also, the, even the distances between molecules, they change uh, depending on the context. So the distance between two molecules um, within a strawberry data set is different from a distance between two molecules in the tomato data set. And here we just mm -hmm. averaged results. Um, but there are also different between uh, green strawberries and ripe strawberries and rotten strawberries. So the distances are uh, empirical distances that fluctuate depending on the environment. So in other words, you can think of this map. It's not, um, there is some uh, dynamics to it that one could study in the future with additional data. You know, how does this map deform as we change the data set? And also, some of you may know there were a series of debates about what is, um, how many orders can human perceive and what is dimensionality of this space? So, and the computation for the number of orders was um, similar to, um, uh, one of the variables was how big is the dimensionality of the space? So my point of view, you know, my contribution to the debate uh, is that I think that the space is low dimensional, but you can have 
higher or more or less resolution depending on a human. So you would think that, you know, people who drink wines or um, um, other products. So you can have, I still have a low dimensional map, but they can have um, finer gradation with this, this map to distinguish larger number of states. Mm -hmm. so, um, yes, and we can talk about, for example, different species, uh, whether uh, the mouse has more receptors than the fly, and uh, you know the elephant is even more than the human. So depending on the number of receptors that you have, uh, you will have a higher resolution within the space, but the space can still be two or three dimensional. Okay. And um, any any questions about this? Any debates? Um, on uh, on this point of view, I mean the alternative is the alternative argument is that this the olfactory space is high dimensional. So um, that's a disclaimer on my part. So when you read papers, you can think about you know this lecture and whether you agree or you know maybe there is new data uh, whether this space is. Um, High dimensional, or the space is low dimensional, but has uh, high re high resolution within the low dimensional space. And the same thing is actually true uh, in visual domain. So um, there are uh, papers uh, on hyperbolic visual perception. Uh, so there's many. Do you know that you have a hyperbolic perception, or, or how it can be tested? I think I mentioned in the beginning of uh, this series of lectures that um, you can have these alleys. You uh, do an experiment where um, how should the room be positioned in order to be perceived as having straight um, walls. And it actually has to be curved to be perceived as straight, provided you do not move. So when you move, you can figure out the distances. but based on the two eyes and perception within several meters of the head is hyperbolic. Any questions about the olfactory map and the positions of points? Um, <laughs> so maybe I have a question. So, uh, so these are uh, maps which have to do with uh, say, physical properties of uh, the different samples. So do this map uh, or do this metric uh, correspond uh, to perception, in the sense to the response uh, of the olfactory system? So that if two odors uh, are close uh, in this space, uh, then also the response of the olfactory system should be similar. So this is some little bit um, of an ongoing work, and I do not have. Um, 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 so what we find in preliminary studies is that you can define distances between molecules based on um, abundances in the natural world, as in this case, or you can define distances between molecules based on their physiochemical parameters. Um, correlation across uh, um, different abundances. And preliminary evidence indicates that, and, and then I can define distances between molecules based on neural activation. And it can be receptors in the nose, or it can be high order neurons. So what it seems is that the distances between, based on um, chemistry, are more closely associated with distances um, at the receptor level, but the distances based on abundances in, like, in the NIST world are more closely associated with high-order neural responses. 
Mm -hmm. And in this case, we are measuring perception. So I think the goal of the perception, the perception is most closely correlated with the natural abundances because that's the, the final goal is to figure out what is happening inside the sample, not the, the particular chemistry of the molecule. So that's um, kind of preliminary evidence and thoughts in that direction. In, in other words, um, yeah. Yeah, I think that that's... Uh, mm -hmm. So we can talk about a little bit more about human perception now. Um, yeah, I think there was something else I was going to say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So human perception. Then. Um, this was actually, I think, um, you know, for a long time, and even right now, for human perception is based on um, the descriptors. So, you know, how, like, uh, fishy or chemical the space is and so on. And then within there you, you go various uh, categories. And um, um, the categories themselves, as you see, there are a little bit of hierarchical. So now we can um, transition from the space of natural orders. There is a data set of uh, actually mostly unnatural orders. And uh, they are ranked with, um, um, according to these human descriptors. And we now assign distances to the orderants depending on how human observers thought they were similar or dissimilar. And here's an equation that um, I think I will uh, address closer to the, um, be before the lecture is that here, the correlation doesn't quite work for us. So we had to switch to Euclidean distances between the human rankings along these descriptors with the idea that if something is, um, if one order is ranked as 100% fishy, but the other one is ranked at 0% fishy, and then they're correlated, um, so they can be um very correlated but um at least um you, you can do so in the previous analysis with the correlations we actually took the absolute value so the absolute value here doesn't work so a closer approximation was a euclidean distance across many components and uh, here is some visualization from previous papers and uh that indicated this perceptual space is curved. And uh, this is the work by Alex Kulakov. And uh, they even say that it's a potato chip geometry, which is a hyperbolic geometry. And then here's another paper. Um, and uh, if you plot um, kind of in the flat representation of PC1 versus PC2, on uh, these points, you can even see the hyperbola here. So now, motivated by these studies and also by our general interest in hyperbolic geometry, so we look at these topological signatures over this. And uh, turns out, so here is the Betty curve 1 and Betty curve 2. So now it's split a little bit by the Betty curve. And I'm showing you the fits using Euclidean. Um, the data is here. And this is a 3D hyperbolic space. And we try to fit the uh, dimension of the space as um, in terms of to fit the integrated Betty value 1. And then using the same parameters, make a prediction for Betty curve 2. 
So one can see that the data for the Betty curve two is much more noisier than for the Betty curve one. And it also has lots of these peaks, disjoint peaks. So it turns out that whenever you have the multi-peaked Betty curves, it means that the data is um, not uniformly distributed, but more clustered. And that leads to these multi-peak curves. So in terms of the, and I will show you the, the fit to the space, but in terms of the integrated Betty value here, you can see that this three-dimensional space fits as well as higher dimensional spaces, but the deviation increases with dimension. So the 3D space is the lowest dimension that um, fits the data. And then by comparison, the Euclidean space, uh, if it fits the Betty curve number one in terms of integrated Betty value, it doesn't in um, the terms of the Betty curve number two. So that's the motivation. And here is the visualization. So I told you that um, here the distribution of points is very different from the previous case. We are no longer have points that are distributed on the surface, but some are more central and some are further away. So this, the central points are, you can think of them as generalist orders. So the orders that are in many, many sources. So you would say, for example, you can have one molecule, a molecule that is in all dairy products versus another molecule that is only in a specific um, food source. So that would be an example. So one can, um, so that's the visualization of molecules in that data set. And now you can see there are many more molecules that need to be sampled in order to fill the space <laughs> in other uh, parts of it. Any questions about human perception? So the reason why in the Betty curve two you have these spikes is because you have uh, very few data points? No, I would say the, the number of data points is not small. It's actually, you know, 127 uh, or so. But uh, I think the data is more clustered and um, it's not uniformly distributed. And okay. this leads to these multi multiple peaks. Okay. So um, now very briefly in the remaining um, eight or so minutes. So it actually was published. So it's hyperbolic geometry in mammalian gene expression. But I wanted to um, here maybe focus only on one slide. Um, we, can, we can talk more slides, but um, the main points that I would say highlight the differences with the topological analysis and also what to do with um, multiple variables and uh, give you an intuition, another intuition for why hyperbolic space, when it works and when it doesn't fit the data. So the, we use here a different method. So some of you are might be very familiar with the multidimensional scaling. So this is the method that we used here. And uh, advantage of this method is that it is a metric method, so it's not a topological method. And it's very fast versus Betty curves are computationally expensive. We can only compute it for less than um, 150 points versus there are many thousands of cells or in, in, even in, in neural data sets. So that would be um, one point. And uh, so in, in this case, it's a metric method. And um, the idea of the multidimensional scaling is that you're again are working with distances 
So suppose you have a set of points, you evaluate distances, and then you don't know these points. So you want to reconstruct the position of the points based on their distances. So that's the multidimensional scaling. And regular multidimensional scaling can work very nicely. Now, the same thing you can do in the hyperbolic space. You take a set of points, you evaluate hyperbolic distances, and then you move points around in order to get um, the match. So that's uh, an illustration of um, hyperbolic um, multidimensional scaling. But then there are two versions of the multidimensional scaling. One of them is a metric method. The other is a non-metric method. The metric method attempts to get at, um, you know, this is called the Shepard diagram, the plot of initial distances versus after the embedding distances. And the metric method metric MDS gives you a straight line. And the other one, non-metric, is again a similar rank ordering. So uh, it um, says I'm fine with uh, a curve that is not a straight line as long as the rank ordering of distances is preserved after the embedding. So it turns out that you can use this non-metric method as a way to detect differences in geometry. It's, um, it's a little bit, um, it has a few steps in the logic. And I'll show you how it works. So imagine that you have data that was taken from Euclidean space and you put it in another Euclidean space. Then you will have a nice match between distances before uh, embedding and after embedding. And now you take these Euclidean points and you force them into a hyperbolic space of a certain dimension. A regular multidimensional scaling method will produce a straight line but a bigger scatter. The non-metric method will produce a curve that is tight, but um, will not be a flat, a straight curve. So now you can use this deviation in this curve as a way, as a signature to detect the mismatch in geometry between my original data distances and the embedding data distances. So it's a multidimensional scaling. It's non-metric because we are looking for Shepard diagrams that are not penalized for being a straight line. The distances are evaluated with hyperbolic metric. And then the second derivative of the Shepard, um, this uh, Shepard diagram gives you the, uh, the difference in curvature between the true space and the embedding space. Okay, so this is, this is a lot of information, but um, um, any questions about that? So to follow up, if you take data from hyperbolic space and you put it in the hyperbolic space, you will have a straight line. And then from hyperbolic space to Euclidean, the Shepard diagram will curve, but in the opposite direction. So you can use the convexity, not to overuse the word curvature, the convexity of the Shepard diagram as an indicator of the mismatch in the curvature between one um, intrinsic space and the embedding space. Questions? Okay, well, so then I will just tell you the conclusions, maybe two slides, is that if we look at, say, geometry of uh, gene expression, 
then what we find is that if you take lots of different cells and lots of genes, and the cells are diverse, then the geometry is hyperbolic. But if you measure cells only with respect to a small number of genes, or the cells are from a similar <clears throat> um, body part, kind of similar organ, same organ, then the geometry will be <laughs> Euclidean. And I think that makes sense because you can always approximate hyperbolic geometry with a locally Euclidean geometry. So I think I will stop here and ask for final questions, and then I will put a concluding slide um, here. Um, so we discussed today examples of hyperbolic geometry in uh, plant volatiles, human perception. And this is visualization that I only showed to you in the conclusions of gene expression. Um, yeah, so approximately, yes, yeah, so we see natural orders from plants and animals and human perception, gene expression. And this is actually, if you heard of the TISNI, so that's our version of the hyperbolic TISNI, which we think works better for biological signals. And then uh, I think I'm ready to ask for your questions. So do I have questions? So, so maybe I'll start. So, so what is the meaning of the dimension uh, that you extract from uh, this method? So, uh, I mean, the, say, in human perception uh, and natural orders, I think you get uh, three dimensions. So uh, what does it mean? That there are three coordinates, three relevant variables? Yes, I would say so, yes. So um, we, we think that um, it also can be equivalent. It also may be an indication of the branching uh, ratio. So in terms of a continuous map, this is how many independent variables I need to have to characterize the space. And it also... Mm -hmm you can make a connection with the branching ratio of the underlying tree. So, uh, and can you say something on what are these three dimensions, these three variables, or these three So, um, so one of them, so this, this third dimension is the radial dimension is um, kind of a derivative versus um, master regulator. And uh, the other two dimensions, so we have uh, freedom to define them because there are many, many options and they're interdependent. So in this case, um, we chose um, like acidity and I think molecular boiling point. But you can find other dimensions so that are maybe more relevant. So in the case of uh, um, strawberry and fermenting strawberries, we actually see that the data follows kind of like a spiral. And um, um, there is a, so one of the angular coordinates is um, a fermenting angle. And uh, you can shift it depending on admixtures in the yeast. So the interpretation of the coordinates, I, I think that's, uh, um, you know, what are the best coordinates that, that remains to be specified because that depends on the particular question and what um, kind of, uh, either in relation to the neural system or um, the specific biological problems, such as fermentation, what, what are the parameters of the fermentation. Mm -hmm. I hope that... So, because, you know, if the space is low-dimensional, they have thousand different variables to look at, um, mm -hmm. then 
I, I can I can you know define many apps. Oh, sorry, that's that's my group, but um, that um, you can define many many axes, but the question is which of them are more useful for mm -hmm. a specific biological question. I have two questions following the question of the meaning of um, the number of dimensions. Uh, what kind of consequences or I don't know um, how could we say something about the fact that the hyperbolic geometry is the one that fits better the data um, so I would say um, in the case of um, <clears throat> some of the newer methods you can um, uh, that we are trying to develop. For example, you can have a Bayesian uh, uh, create information criterion and uh, to determine the optimal dimension and optimal curvature based on multidimensional scaling. So it's a, a statistical statement saying uh, if I am bad points in this space versus the other space, I have so many deviations and this is my noise model, and I think that you know the Bayesian information criterion um, tells you that this is the optimal dimension is this, and the optimal curvature is that. And in the multidimensional scaling, you can vary the curvature, and it will even you know for some of the um, analysis that we do, you can and uh, run the analysis and. It, tells you that the curvature is 10 to the minus 2. So the, in this case, the space is approximately Euclidean. My second, sorry, my second question was, um, if you could give me um, Okay, so it says that it helps to improve the visualization of the data. Yes. Um, I, I suppose I, I, it's better if we know hyperbolic geometry before understanding the visualization, right? I mean, yes. or, or, or. So this is some of the slides that you, know, you can see here um, from this slide. So this is a TISNI, the visualization method. And based on this analysis of gene expression, we think that the data is locally Euclidean, but globally hyperbolic. So we add to TISNI hyperbolic large scale constraint. And then um, you can look at, for example, the embedding distances versus data distances compared to other methods. So in this case, they have local hyperbolic geometry and no large scale constraint. And you can see that there is a kind of a more faithful embedding. And um, I also had this uh, analysis for gene expression, where this is the quality of local embedding versus the quality of uh, clustering coefficient. And uh, you can have um, various versions. This is the hyperbolic TISNI, and then this is another method that we worked on. So you can. Uh, have quantitative um, measurements of um, the quality of the visualization. And one last question, sorry. Uh, this is, uh, the geometry is a consequence of the statistics of the data or is a consequence of the data itself? I would say statistics of the data. I, I don't know, I mean, the, the statistics of the data is the consequence of the okay. data, no? Sorry, uh, sorry. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, my, my, my question is, okay, so it's, uh, sorry, it's a consequence of uh, different sets of data will have different geometries or all the data that are trying to maximize information will have the same kind of geometry, that kind of question was. I think that's the implication. So of what we are trying to, the long-term goal, but it hasn't been established because right now we are only looking at, um, you know, 
finite number of data sets. And in some cases, you find hyperbolic geometry. And um, in other cases, the, the curvature is less. So that's the overall implication that if you have a um, hierarchical system and you would like to maximize information in the presence of binary on-off states, then there are reasons to expect hyperbolic geometry based on optimality arguments. And then one can verify that in, in some number of uh, cases that to the present are limited. Okay, but that's the overall kind of roadmap for future work. Okay, got to. Okay. Uh, any other question? So if not, then I think uh, we can thank uh, Tatiana for this uh, nice set of lectures. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you. I will upload the um, lectures four and five, and uh, I will communicate with uh, Matteo regarding your exam. Yes, thank you very much. Okay. So have a nice well. weekend uh, then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.